folks, I'm Ben Starr, the Ultimate Food Geek. Welcome back to my kitchen. Today, I have a question for you. Have you ever found yourself in a situation like this? My phone's ringing, sorry. Hello? Oh, hi! It's my sister-in-law. Oh, you're gonna come over to my house for dinner? Oh, that, that's awesome, when? Three hours, okay. And you'd like for me to make my famous bread for you? Well, well sure, I'd, uh, I'd love to make that for you in three hours. Okay, great, see you then, bye. <laughs> Folks, the better your sourdough game gets, the more often you're gonna get last minute calls like that. And as we all know, my regular simple sourdough method requires that you start the dough the day before you plan to bake, if not super early in the morning on bake day, because we're looking at a 12 to 24 hour initial fermentation time. That's not very conducive to just finding out somebody's coming over for dinner in a few hours, right? Luckily, I have a few cheats in my back pocket that will let you churn out a loaf of bread using your sourdough starter in a short amount of time, as little as two hours, believe it or not, from start to finish, if you incorporate all of the unholy shortcuts that I'm gonna offer you guys today. Now, there are a lot of you who are gonna unsubscribe from my channel after you watch this video, because I'm going to be doing a lot of things that are considered sacrilegious by true sourdough bakers. But what's the alternative if you've got somebody coming for dinner later on today and you haven't started a loaf of bread in time? Now, to make the fullest use of these shortcuts, you are going to need a stand mixer and a microwave. And I realize that not everybody has those. So you can actually make this recipe without any power equipment at all, using your hands and giving a little bit more time to rise. But then you're looking at like a three to three and a half hour process from start to finish, which is a lot shorter than that 18 to 24 hours that a traditional loaf of simple sourdough takes. Alrighty, let's get started. As you may have surmised, we are going to be resorting to this stuff to boost our leavening power and get us from beginning to end in two hours. Now, before you get out the tar and feathers, I know many sourdough bakers absolutely hate this stuff and don't even allow it anywhere near their kitchens, but there is a time and a place to use commercial yeast. And one of those times and places is when sister-in-law is coming to dinner in three hours. Now the stuff in this packets, folks, is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and that's exactly what's in your sourdough starter. It's just, you've got multiple strains of wild yeast in your sourdough starter, and this is a selected strain of very robust wild Saccharomyces cerevisiae that has been in cultivation for a long, long time in these factories. In fact, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is what's in your starter, is also used to make pretty much everything that we ferment as humans, from wine to beer to bread. And when you go to the supermarket to buy yeast, you're gonna notice two different types of yeast on the shelf, active dry and rapid rise. And there's not much difference in the two packets, except that this packet contains a lot more individual cells of Saccharomyces cerevisiae than the active dry does. And also the particle size in this packet is much, much smaller. That means it dissolves more quickly and disperses more quickly throughout the matrix of your dough. The manufacturer always recommends that for active dry yeast, you dissolve it in warm water first, wait for it to kind of puff up for proof that it is alive, and then you add that liquid to the dry ingredients of your bread and proceed. You can actually make this bread with either of these if you happen to only have active dry in your cupboard or in your freezer at the moment, and you should always keep this stuff in your freezer, especially if you don't go through it very quickly. But you'll save about five to 10 minutes on the back end by using the rapid rise yeast. So if you're running to the supermarket to grab some yeast for this recipe, get yourself the rapid rise. And folks, don't get too upset or uncomfortable about the fact that we're putting commercial yeast into our sourdough, because that's what a lot of artisan bakeries out there do. Even supermarket sourdough doesn't even use sourdough starter, they just use yeast and vinegar to make their bread taste a little bit sour. But a lot of artisan bakeries augment their sourdough with commercial yeast and allow it to do the heavy lifting and just flavor their dough with sourdough starter, which is exactly what we are doing today. If this is the first one of my videos that you've watched, some of the stuff that I may say over the next few minutes is gonna sound really confusing to you because on my channel, we do sourdough the easy way which is radically different from the way most teachers on YouTube are teaching sourdough. We never discard starter. We only feed our starter when we get low on starter and need to make more. We never feed it before we bake. 
even if that means we're only feeding it a few times a year. We don't knead or slap or fold or do any of that kind of stuff because we let the bread make itself, which it will do if you give it time. But today, we don't have any time. So let's get started. Today I'm gonna be speaking in ounces. So for you metric folks, the conversions are right there on the screen. You can also expand the video description right underneath this video, click where it says more, and the recipe is written out there with all of the metric conversions. You can also go to my website, ultimatefoodgeek.com and print out this recipe for free. So we are starting with 10 ounces of warm water. And by warm, I say it feels warm when you stick your finger in it. It's not ouchy hot, it should be comfortable for you to leave your finger in and feel perceptibly warm. Now, if you're really that paranoid about it, just make sure that the temperature of the water is not above 100 degrees Fahrenheit using your kitchen thermometer. 90 degrees Fahrenheit is ideal. We want 10 ounces. That's the same thing as 10 fluid ounces. To this warm water, we are going to add one package of yeast. Ideally, the fast acting or rapid rise or active dry is also fine if that's what you've got. We're gonna give that a quick little stir. And now we're gonna add our sourdough starter. All of my recipes call for starter that's at 100% hydration, meaning you feed it equal weights of flour and water each time you feed it. You may know that as a one to one to one, or a one to two to two, or a one to three to three. That just means when you feed your starter, you are feeding four ounces of flour and four ounces of water, the exact same weight of starter to water. If you feed your starter with a measuring cup, your starter is not at 100% hydration. This recipe is gonna end up too sticky, it's gonna fail, and you're gonna be really frustrated. You can check out my troubleshooting simple sourdough video linked above for information on how to fix the hydration of your starter if your starter is overhydrated. But if you end up with really sticky dough, that is the problem. This starter just came right out of the refrigerator. It is cold, sleepy, it has not been fed in weeks. That's the kind of starter that all of my recipes call for. Now, if you happen to be somebody that feeds your starter regularly, totally fine. The more robust your starter is, the more it will contribute to the leavening of this recipe. Now, one more thing, folks. Do not use the same spoon that has come in contact with the commercial yeast to interact with your starter because then you're going to be inoculating your starter with this hyper-aggressive type of yeast and it can drown out some of the wild yeasts that are already in your starter. So you wanna keep your starter safe from any direct contact with this commercial yeast. We are using eight ounces of starter and this is twice as much as is normally called for in my simple sourdough recipe, but we're adding this much because we want this sourdough starter to flavor our loaf. So we're using a larger amount of it. For those of you who are upset that I'm not giving you the ingredients in cups, you cannot bake consistently with cup measurements, folks. Even measuring cups are flat out incorrect in terms of their volume sometimes. So please get yourself a scale. My favorite scale is linked in the comment thread below. If you'd like to get mine, it's restaurant quality, takes AA batteries, lasts forever, great stuff. All right, now we are going to stir this around to kind of disseminate the starter into that liquid. And if you're using a stand mixer, you don't have to stir this too much because the mixer is really gonna get this stuff incorporated very quickly. But if you were going to be mixing and kneading this dough by hand, a little bit of extra stirring now will save you uh, 30 seconds on the back end. All right, now it is time for our dry ingredients. We are using 18 ounces of flour. That is one pound and two ounces. And I am using all-purpose flour today, an organic all-purpose flour that I get in bulk at Costco. But you can also use bread flour. Bread flour will give you a higher rise and a little bit more of a chewy consistency to your loaf. All right, that's one pound and two ounces. And now for our salt. For those of you who are accustomed to adding about three quarters of an ounce of salt to simple sourdough, we are backing off on that. Salt actually curtails the activity of fermentation and we don't wanna curtail the activity, we want to encourage it. So we're gonna use a more standard ratio of salt for this loaf of half of an ounce. That's about 2.2% of the baker's weight. Does not matter what kind of salt you use as long as you weigh it. I was using Morton's kosher salt. Now it's time to get these ingredients incorporated. Because I have the luxury of a stand mixer, I'm gonna let my stand mixer do the work. If you're making this dough by hand, you need to stir it around in the bowl until it gets hard to stir, then switch over to your hand until all of the dry ingredients are incorporated. Then take it out onto your countertop and knead it for 10 to 15 minutes until it's nice and elastic and pliable. With your stand mixer, that's only gonna take five to seven minutes. The bread is finished kneading. And now for you microwave haters, 
you just want to cover your bowl, either with a kitchen towel, pot lid, plastic wrap, something like that. Put this in the warmest place in your house until the dough has doubled. And how long it takes to double depends on how warm that place is. It's gonna take probably 60, maybe up to 90 minutes. Put it in your oven with the oven light on, on top of your fridge, in the utility room while the dryer's running. The warmer the spot, the faster it will be ready. But I'm gonna show all of you who have no irrational fear of the microwave how to get this proofed in under 30 minutes, believe it or not. And the first step to that is to transfer it to a non-metallic bowl because we do not put metal in the microwave. Now, I'm going to press this dough down just so that we can get a really good visual depiction of when the dough has doubled. I'm gonna put a line of tape at about, well, it's really hard to do from down there, but I'm gonna do it anyway. We'll put it about right there to sort of indicate where the dough is at its default level. Ideally, for the next step, we want to cover this, and I happen to have these nice little plastic lids that form fit onto my bowls. These are linked below in the video description. I find them super helpful for proofing bread. If you don't have a non-metallic lid that fits on top of your bowl, just cover it in plastic wrap or something like that. Microwave haters, I really wish that you would trust me. As the ultimate food geek, I solemnly swear to you that the microwave is one of the most important and effective tools in the kitchen for a variety of reasons. There is no tool better for toasting nuts and seeds and spices. No tool better for tempering chocolate no tool better for caramelizing onions, and certainly no tool better for proofing bread in a hurry. But you might hate your microwave because you don't actually know how to use it, because I'm gonna be honest, most people don't. Very few times do you need to ever use your microwave on the default high power setting that your microwave often operates at. That is too much power for pretty much everything. So what we're doing today is we're going to decrease the power at which that microwave operates down to 10% of its normal default power supply. And that is going to gently warm the bread dough from the inside out and allow it to proof in 30 minutes or less. Now, if you have never changed the power level on your microwave first, I want you to practice a few times with a cup of water because that will tell you if you have really reduced the power. When we reduce the power to 10%, you're going to notice practically no heating of any substance in the microwave over a one minute period. So put a cup of cold water in your microwave first and practice lowering the heat. Now everybody's microwave is a little bit different, but you're going to have some button on your microwave that says power or power level. With my microwave, I have to tell it how long it's going to cook first before I have access to the power. So I'm going to do time cook for five minutes, and now I'm gonna press power, and it shows a default of 10, that's 100%. I'm gonna switch it to one, that's 10%. Some people's microwaves, you have to push the power button repeatedly, and it cycles down from 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, etc. But once you have the power down to one, you're gonna turn it on. Now, you are gonna do this with a cup of water for one minute first, just to make sure you've done it correctly, and you are going to be very careful for each of these next few cycles that we're going to be microwaving our dough to make sure you always turn the power down every single cycle because the microwave always defaults back to 100% after the end of each cooking cycle. So what I'm doing is microwaving my bread dough for five minutes at the lowest power setting. Then we're gonna take it out and take a look. All right, five minutes already getting leavening. Look at that, how crazy is that? Now I am going to just stick my hand on top of the dough to see if we have any perceptible heat. And no, we don't. It's the exact same temperature as when I put it in. So I just want to give it about a minute to allow any heat that's built up to dissipate into the dough. And then we're going to do another five minute cooking cycle, making sure that we have reset it to the lowest power setting. All right, second round is done. And as you can see, we've got even more of a rise. Now I can tell just by holding my hands underneath this bowl that we're getting only a slight warmth. So we really are not even close to the danger zone. And folks, the danger zone is above like 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeast doesn't even really begin to die until 130 degrees Fahrenheit. So even if we get this bread up into the 90s, that just means it's gonna prove super, super, super fast. If you're worried about it, just take the temperature with your home thermometer and make sure you're not above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. You'll be totally fine. All right, I've given this a little bit of time for that heat to dissipate, so it's gonna go back in for another five minute cooking cycle. All right, that's the end of our third cycle. 
I don't think that we are even 17 or 18 minutes from when we stopped kneading the dough. Again, I'm only barely feeling any warmth through the bowl, so we know that we're not getting anywhere near the danger zone. So we're gonna send this for a fourth five minute cycle. All right, that finishes our third five minute cycle. And look at the rise that we are getting. I mean, this dough was being kneaded like 17 minutes ago. Pretty incredible, right? I'm only feeling just a little bit of warmth through the dough so we know we're not in any kind of danger of getting too hot for our yeast. So we are going to let this go for a fourth five minute cycle. All right, that is the end of our fourth five minute cycle getting a little bit of condensation inside, so we know we do have some heat building up. And look at that rise, folks, we are almost there. Again, no real significant heat, just a little bit radiating from the bowl, so I know we're still fine with our dough. We're gonna do a final five minute cycle. Now, it may take your microwave less or more cycles of this, and you may end up wanting to adjust your time from three minutes, to six minutes, something like that, until you get a doubling of your dough. It's not an exact number of cycles because everybody's microwave is powered differently. Your yeast are different than mine. Your flour is different than mine. Your starter is different than mine. So you just need to continue these cycles until you reach a doubling of the bulk of the dough. And for me, that looks like it's gonna be five cycles of five minutes each. All right, that is the end of our fifth cycle. And look at this, folks. We have achieved doubling of our dough's bulk in less than 30 minutes from the time that it was kneading in the stand mixer. How crazy is that? I know, I am a heretic for rising bread dough in the microwave. And you are only allowed to do this when you are trying to churn out a loaf of bread in a hurry. And no, this bread isn't gonna be fractionally as good as our wonderful simple sourdough that ferments all night long at room temperature and develops all that delicious flavor. But sometimes you just gotta get a loaf done in a hurry, and this is how you do it. So now it's time to prepare our baking vessel. If you are going to bake this loaf in a loaf pan, grease your loaf pan or line it with parchment at this time. If you are going to do the preferred method, which is baking inside of a Dutch oven, get your Dutch oven greased really well. If you're one of those people that really likes to use parchment, I get a lot of questions about using parchment in Dutch ovens, and I don't like to do it because you know what happens when you try to push a sheet of parchment down into a circular Dutch oven? You get a bunch of crinkles, and sometimes those crinkles bake into the bottom of the loaf, and then you gotta cut pieces of parchment paper out of the bottom of your loaf after they're done. So I really do not like using parchment sheets inside my Dutch oven. However, from the other baking side of my life, they do make pre-cut parchment rounds. Of course, you could make this at home with your parchment, but ordering a whole bunch of these is pretty cheap if you do it in bulk. And you're probably gonna find one online that fits just on the inside of your Dutch oven perfectly. So if you are a parchment person, you can definitely do that. But those of you who are having trouble with your bread sticking to your pot, that's either being caused by not greasing your pot well enough or the hydration of your bread being too high. And if you know you're measuring correctly, that means that your starter is overhydrated and you need to correct your starter. My troubleshooting simple sourdough video will help you do that. I'm not gonna use parchment today because I don't need to, but I'm going to generously oil this pot just to make sure we have no sticking. All right. We're gonna add a little bit of flour to our work surface, not too much because we want it to stick. That helps with shaping. And out comes our bread. Beautiful, fluffy, so nice. I'm gonna scatter a little bit of flour on top and flour my hands. And now we're gonna just shape this into a nice bowl here. Now the dough is a little bit stickier than simple sourdough, but it's certainly not too sticky to work with or shape a nice tight bowl. All right, we've got that nice and tight and sealed on the bottom. That's gonna go into our baking vessel. And we are going to do a 30 minute second rise. Now, obviously I can't use the microwave for this because this is a cast iron Dutch oven. And if you're rising in a loaf pan, it's probably an aluminum loaf pan. If you have a ceramic or glass baking vessel, you could certainly accelerate your second proof in the microwave if you wanted to. But because I don't have that luxury today, I'm gonna let this proof at room temperature for 30 minutes before we score and bake. Now, we are not going to bake this loaf with the cold oven start like we do for the current version of Simple Sourdough. 
And that's simply because that loaf of bread takes a full hour to bake because we have to account for the time that the oven is preheating. I can be preheating the oven right now while my bread is rising and I'm going to save myself 15 minutes of bake time. So I'm going to preheat my oven to 475 degrees Fahrenheit. That is hotter than we bake normal simple sourdough at. And the rack's probably going to be one rung above the bottom of the oven, whatever fits your Dutch oven. So get your oven preheated right now. Now I'm just going to score this bread with a razor blade. You can also use kitchen shears if you prefer to do it that way. And we're going to get it into the 475 degree oven for 30 minutes covered, 15 minutes uncovered. Looking good. All right, our bread is done. It is a beautiful golden brown color. It smells great and it's crackling. Tell me if you can hear this. I just love listening to that sound as fresh hot bread cools. Looking at this loaf a little bit, folks, we are underproofed just a bit. So we probably could have done with another 15 minutes or so of proofing on that second round before we baked it in the oven. You can tell because we've got a split right here and I didn't cut quite deeply enough into the loaf to get that beautiful ear. But still, for two hours of frantic effort, it ain't bad. Now, of course, the problem is bread really needs to be fully cool before you slice it. Slicing into warm bread ends up gumming up the knife and making that interior crumb gummy. So wait as long as you possibly can before slicing this loaf. If you must tear into it immediately, quite literally, tear into it. Don't slice it, tear it open, because that will save the crumb from that gumming up that happens on the knife when you're slicing through warm bread. Now, one trick that you can use to speed up this process is to jab some holes into the crust to let the steam escape more quickly. That'll gain you five or 10 minutes on that cool down time. I'm gonna give this bread at least 30 minutes to rest and then I'll come back and we'll cut it open, see what the inside looks like and see how it tastes. We've got an extremely soft, spongy crumb, some nice crackle on the outside of the crust. These are the knife wounds from when we stabbed our bread to help it cool faster. Let's give it a taste. Very nice, super thin crackly crust, a very, very soft pillowy crumb on the inside. You know, it only tastes faintly like sourdough bread, but it's really good, especially for going from dry ingredients to fully baked in two hours. Nobody in the world is gonna complain about this bread. Now, folks, this is not intended to replace your simple sourdough regimen. Actually, this bread is a lot more work than simple sourdough. We had to do a lot more to get it from start to finish in that two hour period. So simple sourdough is still much, much, much easier to bake. The flavor and texture and crust is superior, but it's not a loaf that you can start and have finished in two to three hours in an emergency situation. Now, I get a lot of questions from you guys about how to store sourdough bread so that it stays as fresh as possible if it's not all consumed in the first day. And my first response to you is, consume it all in the first day. Bread is never as good the second day unless you do something to revive it like toast it or warm it. But I have recently discovered a really, really cool product. It is beeswax cloth. This is a regular cotton cloth that's been completely infused with beeswax. It actually smells like honey, it's quite lovely. But the cool thing about it is that it sticks to itself, but it does not stick to bread. So you can wrap up the loaf that you haven't finished. Tuck the beeswax cloth right around it and it will make a form-fitting container for your bread. It allows the bare minimum of moisture transpiration through it, so your bread retains most of its moisture without sweating like it would if you put it into a plastic or Ziploc bag. I've discovered that when I slice my bread on day two, it's only fractionally more stale than it was on day one. And that's something I've never been able to do with any other type of storage medium. So I am incredibly thrilled with these. 
They are a little bit pricey at $15 per cloth, but the cloth is reusable for a year or longer. If it gets dirty, you can wash it with cool soapy water, and you can also use it to wrap cheeses and all sorts of other things that really don't benefit from a completely airtight environment like a Ziploc bag or plastic wrap, but where you definitely want to conserve an appropriate amount of moisture so that the product doesn't dry out or get slimy on the other end of the spectrum. These are super, super cool. I'll post the link to these in the video description below. So that's about it, folks. My sister-in-law should be here any minute, and you know, she lived in Italy for 23 years, so she's really a bread snob, but something tells me she's gonna be completely satisfied with this loaf, and it only took two hours to turn out. Not gonna call this sourdough, I'm gonna call it sourdough flavored bread. How's that? Now, I hope you guys will forgive me for all of the transgressions against the laws of sourdough that I have committed during the last several minutes. But I hope you learned a valuable technique for those occasions which do come up more often than not when suddenly you need to have bread on the table in a few hours and you didn't start it yesterday. Folks, this recipe and lots more are on my website, ultimatefoodgeek.com. I'm Ben Starr, the Ultimate Food Geek. Thanks for watching and have a great day.